Good morning, Worsted Park. Oh, dear, dear. You see, now I left you in the hands of that very nice Mr. Richard Powell last year. And look, you've forgotten the only line you need to remember. Good morning, Worsted Park. And it's really important because, and don't say I told you, there's cameras. And you're in here and out there, there could be anywhere between my neighbour and hundreds of people watching to be aware. So good morning, everybody. My name is not on the screen, so I better introduce myself. For those who don't know me, sadly, a number of you do. My name is Keith Moore and I work for the Environment Agency. And I'm really delighted to be asked back this year to act as your host to guide you through what is in fact a fantastic conference agenda. Um, I have, as usual, a couple of announcements, some really interesting, some less so. Um, so let's do the really interesting ones. First of all, it's the 11th Coast and Estuaries Conference. You haven't had to suffer me for 11 Coast and Estuaries Conferences, but it's the 11th one. You know the organisers think they're on a winner when they start numbering things like the Oscars and the Emmys and the BAFTAs. So this is the 11th one, but it's also the air of the coast, and it's fantastic that in the air of the coast, this is the first, so they're going to restart the counter, East Anglian Coast and Estuaries Conference. So it's a big welcome to everybody from Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex who are with us today. Put together, obviously, by the Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex um, Coast Forums, and we'll be hearing from representatives from them shortly, and the, RFC, the Eastern RFCC as well. So we've come together today to talk about the coast, to consider the coast. It's a coast we love. It's a coast we value, it's a coast we cherish, it's a coast we work with. But it's not just our coast, however much we value it and how much we get from it. It has national significance because although we're blessed to be here on the coast, there are people who travel every year to come to this coast, to our communities, to spend time here, to feel better, to relax, to restore, to rejuvenate and go back. And it's got an international importance, as we'll hear later on this afternoon. As it's the air of the coast, I'm only going to mention it twice. Others may mention it several times. We're also launching a pledge for the coast. If you look straight down the hall, but don't crick your necks, at the back, there is a pledge for the coast. It's being launched here. It's been put together by the Coastal Group Network, National Tourist Academy, the LGA, the One Coast Group, and Coastal Partnership East. And it's your opportunity. It's about your pledge for the coast. What does it mean to you going forward? It's almost like sending yourself a postcard from today that you're going to read in the future. What are you going to do for the coast? What does it mean? How is it special? So there's an opportunity. A lot of my colleagues are around in the orange lanyards. They're the organizers. Do see them. There's the opportunity, tea break, coffee break, lunchtime, etc., to make that pledge. And please do engage with that as well. It will actually be launched as well in Westminster on the 17th of October. So if you like, almost a bit like a sneak preview. One other announcement to make, a late change on the agenda. So you know when you go to a West End show to see a big star, your Glen Closes, your Merrill Streeps, and you rock up and you've got your eight pound ticket in, and then the anonymous voice comes on and says, the part of will be played by Matilda Smith. And she's brilliant, she's fabulous. She's not Meryl Streep. And you immediately realize that you're bragging right and the chance to lean on the bar and say, did I tell you when I went to the West End and saw Meryl, I mean, Matilda Smith in um, Sunset Boulevard? No, so you've lost that immediately. So you've, so you've lost that. So we have got a substitution. Unfortunately, Professor Ivan Hay can't be with us today. We couldn't get Meryl Streep. If you think the A14's bad this morning and the A12, you want to see the flight time from Los Angeles. But we've done better. We have Adam Rowland with us as well. So he is actually stepping in this afternoon and that brings an international context to our course. So we're really grateful for Adam to be there. And to be honest with you, he's not very good. He wouldn't be any good in Sunset Boulevard, but he's blooming brilliant in the RSPB. So it'd be great to get Adam on stage this, after, this afternoon. Final couple of bits for me. I'm now going to talk about the health and safety bit. Now, normally this is the bit where you quickly check your agenda, you finish Wordle, whatever, because the, they never go off. They never go off. But we have a risk this morning that I have to share with you. So the last time I did this event, and I was on stage with Richard Powell, and he's here in the audience today, and he said the word Southwold. These are the risks to watch out. The alarm went off. 
We spent 20 minutes on the grass outside. So, in all seriousness, I'm trying not to appear on stage with Richard Powell. He's on in a moment, but I'm getting off. Um, so just to let you know, facilities, obviously you know where the team coffee is, you found it. Restrooms are off to the right hand side as I look at it, and the fire exits are up there. The congregation point is on the green outside. We'll try not to do that because it's very, very wet. So without further ado, that's the health and safety stuff covered. I'm now going to ask you to give a big welcome and welcome to the stage in the following order. We're going to be joined by Councillor Blaithwaite from Norfolk, Councillor David Bevan from Suffolk, Councillor Lee Scott from Essex can't be with us today but has sent a message to welcome you all to the event and then we'll be joined by Richard Powell, who I've previously mentioned, Chair of Anglia and Eastern RFCC. Watch how quickly I get off stage when he turns up. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please do give a big welcome to the gentlemen who are going to open and the opening remarks for the conference. Councillor Blaithwaite, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for coming. Um, today we're starting off from the north. So I'm from Norfolk and we're moving south uh, to Essex. So I'm very pleased to be the Norfolk contingent and I've only been in this post since March and um, I'm still getting my head around all the acronyms. So forgive me if I use the long ones, the words, but I would just like to say, who is here, uh, who, not here, who went to Telford for the Coast and Flood Conference? Well, you will know that Alan Lovell, chair of the Environment Agency, spoke very movingly about the Norfolk coast. And the reason I believe he spoke about the Norfolk coast is we have an officer who is our CTAP manager. We don't use the word CTAP anymore because we don't like transition and acceleration in the same breath. So we call it Coast Watch. And the first person who calls it CW, I'll come for you. Right, and in March, we went with the Environment Agency to the Norfolk Cliffs, and the day was foul. And anybody who was there will remember, Karen will remember. We were all in Gore-Tex, the hail hit, and the sleet flew, and the wind was four, seven to eight, true easterly, and Alan Lovell was there in a pinstripe suit. And we were all in double Gore-Tex. And as the wind blew and the hail hit his face and his cheeks turned blue, his eyes shut, but his ears stayed open. And that's what he spoke about at the conference at Telford, it was the issues that we face here, well, there in North Norfolk and here in Suffolk. And he really took it on board. And today it's about choices and the choices we have to make. I'm a fly-by-night local politician and we local politicians from time to time have to knock on doors. And this summer I was knocking on doors in a coastal village. And on the seaside of the road, everybody talked about coastal erosion. You could talk of nothing else. And on the other side of the road, the land side of the road, they talked about bins, talked about education, they talked about traffic, they talked about everything, but they didn't particularly talk about coast, except when it came to planning and rollback would affect them with houses near them. So how do we explain and make the choices for the seaside of the road? The ledge, the views across the sea, how do we make the choices for them? That the land that these people walk on and walk their dogs on today will tomorrow be stacking up outside South End, protecting the conurbations. And this is a very, very hard conversation to have. 
And I hope today we will be able to be better placed from all the workshops and what we talk about to make those choices that will affect the people who live on the seaside of the road, on the ledge, to understand better how difficult this will be. And I thank you all for coming and make, helping make those choices today. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning. From Bodicea against the Romans, to St Edmunds against the Vikings, to Hereward against the Normans, swiftly followed by the Dutch, Spanish, German assaults, we East Anglians have learnt to join together to protect our coast from invasion. Our wise men now, and women, predict another invasion. We don't know how soon it will come, but it will come. How hard it hits us depends on what we do now, how we prepare. This conference started in Suffolk, spread to Norfolk, and now Essex. As under Bodicea in 60 AD, we Iceni are a gathering force as we move down the coast to Londonium. We accept we must concentrate our defences and give up some of our coast to the sea, hard as that may be for farms that are losing metres down the cliff every year. We can't do it alone. We're the first line of defence for our hinterland and we seek their support. This conference not only plans our strategy, but also explains to others how important it is. The challenge is that people are slow to invest in a common future. They're too preoccupied with getting through the coming winter to set aside some of the harvest to invest for the future. We're all about engagement engaging our coastal communities to preserve themselves and engaging the rest of the country to support us. We build resilience for the whole country because they could be next. We are the resilience. This gathering has such a vital job to prepare for this next invasion. Regrettably, some communities, it may be their last. Let's keep beating the drums for our home of East Anglia. Thank you. Councillor Leo from Essex, who couldn't join us today. I firstly would like to say how sorry I am I can't be with you today and I had to be at another meeting. But this conference is vitally important. If we look at what is happening to our climate at the moment, if we look at the deluges of rain that we're getting, the effect it's having on our coast, the effect it's having on natural habitats, we have to take things seriously and together we are stronger. In Essex we have 350 miles of estuaries, and tidal inlets. Conservation zones are protected areas and we must continue that protection and fight to make sure that, can, that does go on. People enjoy living here in Essex. The Essex Coastal Forum was first formed back in 2011 after the publication of the Essex and South Suffolk Shoreline Management Plan. The forum gives elected members the opportunity to give their views, share their views and take things forward together. I know there's been a gap in conferences owing to the COVID, but we are now past that. I also would just like to say that the issues that really worry me, coastal erosion, flooding, protecting our nature for our wildlife, and everything that will affect all of our lives. It is so important that the three different areas and counties join together to do this. Can I wish you a fantastic conference? And again, I'm sorry I can't be with you.
just waiting for the fire alarm. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are certain things. My name is Richard Powell. I'm the chair of the RFCC for Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex. Um, there are certain towns and villages and words that uh, when Keith and I work together, you can't mention. It's a bit like being an actor, not mentioning that play. So um, hopefully I'm not going to mention any villages or towns, although I love them all. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get through this. Um, thanks uh, to uh, everyone for coming to the conference. This is an incredibly important uh, uh, conference. And thanks to the CPE team who, once again, have done an amazing job in pulling together the 11th uh, conference on the coast. I think I've done 10 of them. So uh, it's not a, not a bad sort of record. Um, we live in a time of change, and uh, following three councillors, um, I'm going to try and weave my way through without having to repeat uh, many things they say, which I wholly endorse. But it is a time of change. Um, it's a time of climate change. Um, it's a time when we really do have to come to terms with how we handle that, whether we believe it's man-made or not. It's happening. We can see uh, the evidence. We can feel the evidence, and we can feel the community's pain when climate change is going to be affecting our biggest coast more than probably anywhere else in the UK at the moment. It's um, coastal and it's inland, so it's not only if you live on the coast, it's also if you live next to rivers, with our long, slow running rivers, uh, it, it can affect those communities as much as it does. And with the RFCC, we cover all that, um, all that sort of flooding. We have a, a statutory duty, one of them is to help and work with um, different agencies to develop those plans, to look at the funding of those plans, and to oversee uh, that funding across the three counties. Uh, and that's quite exciting, because uh, one of the things we have in this uh, part of the world is a huge, innovative, and great partnership mindset. Uh, we work together really well, um, coast-wise, which has already been mentioned, is a really good partnership coming together, whether it's in Norfolk, Suffolk, or in Essex. Partnership is definitely an East Anglian thing. So whether it's the Iceni that pulled us together or whether it's climate change that's pulling us together, we are really good at working together. It's a region of innovative people, uh, and that's um, uh, really quite exciting in, as we go forward. Solutions are needed for all the things that we do. Um, business as usual is just not an option. So it is finding those solutions and finding those different things. Uh, and it, it's, you need the solutions also to show how funding is important, because funding is also a major, major issue. Uh, we don't have a lot. Um, we have a, a bigger amount than some of my ROCC colleagues. They do look over uh, greedily at the, the budgets for the east of England. Um, but we also have some of the most acute problems. So, but we need to show how we're going to handle those and change those and manage those. So solutions are a, a great thing. And that greater funding brings even more partnerships. So partnership funding and, and external funding and searching for funding is going to be a real challenge for us going forward. Um, a huge amount to do. It's frightening and it's inspiring. Um, it's uh, great for the RFCC, which is a, a, an organisation that is 50% local authority and 50% uh, independent members. And those independent members have skills from uh, geomorphology through to uh, uh, coastal um, landfill sites, through to the environment, through to water resources. So that mix of uh, people gives you that independent think tank uh, and an ability to be an independent uh, 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 process, if you like, in, in looking at the bigger picture as we go forward. So I leave you with uh, the thought of having a, have a great day. Uh, talk to at least two people you've never met. You'll find you have a huge amount in common with them. Um, there'll be all sorts of things that you'll learn today, which is it's, it's hugely inspiring again and, and fantastic to see. And I really look forward to continuing working with all the partners. I'm lucky I just dip in and out of lots and lots of different projects. It's really, uh, really quite um, uh, satisfying and, and, uh, uh, and humbling to see how much work is being done across these three, count these three counties. Uh, and hopefully after today, you'll be inspired to do even more. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the day. Right then, onwards. Thank you to four gentlemen there for their opening and actually reflective remarks, which I think sets the agenda nicely for today. Uh, just before I bring our next speaker on the stage, um, I'm just going to say two words, pebble and bucket. That's it. I'll just leave it there. 
could be a Hans Christian Andersen story, who knows? See me later, but I'll just mention it. Uh, I'll leave that with you to ponder. No cheating in asking the organizers what that means. I'm just saying that now. Right, ladies and gentlemen, this gentleman was with us a few years ago, but as I get older, time speeds up, and I kept telling people, oh, John Curtin, that was only a couple of years ago, he was on stage with us, and it turns out it was five years ago. Oh, how time flies. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together to welcome Professor, and he'll tell you more, John Curtin, who's an Executive Director of Ops at the Environment Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, big coastal welcome for John. Thanks, Keith. I warn you now, I have a bag of sweets because the reason Ivan isn't with us later is he and I were in the Netherlands learning about flood risk and both got unwell. My voice is the only thing that hasn't survived so far, but we'll try not to use them. So thank you for the intro. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I spoke about five years ago as well, actually, because I think there's a theme here. And I have to say the introductions from the councillors and the RFCC are really powerful. And what's really unifying is the need to do something. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. But first, I, I did love the way the title of this conference started with the word reflection, because you'll be more than aware that it's 70 years this year that we've talked about the anniversary of 1953. And in a couple of months, rather frighteningly, it's um, the 10th anniversary of the surge of 2013, which was as high in many places as uh, 1953. So I want to talk about them. The reason for my title is I'm going to pose two challenges that I see from my perspective. And one of them, I think, is cast by the shadow of 1953 and how we've approached, approached flood risk. Um, it has the word personal perspective, which is usually code uh, for it not being EA policy. This is my view from some of the work I've done. Um, and actually, this opening slide, this is from Bacton. Um, that's my attempt at the EA logo on the beach at Bacton when they did the sandscaping. And what I hadn't realised until I was doing this presentation is, you see the boat that was doing the sandscaping mirrors a, a crewless tanker at Bacton in the 53 floods, which was quite a nice parallel. So I'm Exec Director of Operations. I did those, spend six years as Exec Director of Flood and Coastal Risk Management. And before I talk about the journey I see on flood risk in this nation. I just wanted to talk briefly about my journey because there's some relevance here. So my today is actually my 32nd work anniversary with the National Rivers Authority and the Environment Agency is quite frightening. But I use this picture because um, not only have I worked on my power pose after 32 years, as you can see, um, the young man at the bottom is a hydrologist that's just graduated from university. And the interesting thing is, even in the 90, 1990 when I graduated, climate change wasn't taught, even to a hydrologist, right? My whole education was wasted because the whole of the process of my education was you can measure rivers going back in the past, basically do some stats and you'll work out what's going on in the future. That was all nonsense, which is really good because I was described as a deeply average student. So the fact I didn't learn any of that was good news. So, and so my 32 years have been fascinating, scary, um, illuminating because I have had to live alongside many other colleagues, many of you, a climate change journey that has been dramatic, has been devastating in times, has been really challenging, but we've had to learn as we go along. And the good news, I think, is for many of the people I can see in this audience today who are starting their careers, you have the knowledge for the solutions we need. We didn't have that back in the day. So, I've been on a journey, but I've also, you know, it was interesting talking about Iceni, and um, we won't talk about the fact that Athelstan came from the south and conquered the Iceni, that's a different story. But I also love history, so I'm going to start with some reflections. And I am going to start with 1953, which was devastating. So stats are always awful, I think, in flood risk, because they do not really get across the humanity and the empathy of what communities go through. So I can tell you that 28,000 houses flooded, right? It's a stat, you'd see it on the news. Think of your home, draw a circle, and try and imagine 28,000 homes, families, and people outside of it. That was the scale of devastation in 53. Breaches in flood defenses in 1,200 places, twice as many breaches as happened in the Netherlands, which I'll touch on, and sadly, 307 lives lost. And probably the, the saddest feature of 1953 for me is there was no real credible warning and forecasting system. 
So that surge rolled down the East Coast, and people died in Lincolnshire while people went to bed in Canvey Island, oblivious of what was coming. So, so many lives lost unnecessarily. Interestingly, there were attempts afterwards. This is uh, Commander Nigel Parkinson from South House in Norfolk, who shortly, shortly afterwards, I think, came up with the first flood warning system. He decided that he didn't want to be exposed and his community to be exposed like that before. So this barrel, when it fills up with water, reaches a certain height, sets off a siren for the community. And this was done later on in 1953. So probably the first flood warning system we had in the country. But I'll come back to how we've advanced since then. Of course, we think of 1953 as something that affected this country, especially the East Coast, but it had devastating effects in the Netherlands. So I'll just show this video. You'll see it rolls down. These patches are where the, the coast was inundated, where the lives were lost. But you can see over the night of the 31st, <clears throat> as it intensified, it then hit the Netherlands. And although the locations and the breaches were less, there half the breaches happened in the Netherlands, they lost nearly 2,000 lives uh, that night. And it completely changed how the Dutch approached flood risk, including, I think, ourselves, but I'll come back to that in a minute. The Dutch, interestingly, because in today's value, that surge probably caused about 5.5 billion euros worth of damage in the Netherlands in today's terms. And their approach was to close off their coast. They've invested millions in closing off their coast. Um, the first one in 1958, the ISIL barrier, which is now called the Old Lady, but they have tried to seal off the sea since 1953. And we'll come back to some of the challenges on that. I talked about 53 being a shadow of how we do flood risk in this country, but in the Netherlands, it's more than a shadow. It really is deep in their psyche. If you've never been and you're a water professional or you're interested in coastal flood risk, do go to the 1953 Museum in the Netherlands. It's a fantastic museum. In essence, what they've done is, in one of the breaches in the defences in 53, where temporary blocks were put in place, they've carved the museum into these blocks. And it, they take school children. It really helps carry on their story. They've got great emblems here. These are the little badges. You see the 1953 badges that were given out to the thousands and thousands of volunteers that came to the communities affected to clear the mud from their houses. So it's the mud lady's badge. But they also have one of these very moving elements. And I often reflect that we probably should do more, I think, in this country to remember the people we lost in this country. But there are the names of all of the near 2,000 people that died <coughs> on the 1st of February in the Netherlands, scrolling through one of the defences um, that was put in place to seal the breach. So in the Netherlands, their approach has been to seal the coast. Here, our approach was set by a review that happened by Lord Waverley in 1954. And government did a review into the impacts and it set us on train on a journey of engineering the coast in this country in a slightly different way to the Netherlands, but still engineering at its heart. And of course, the Thames barrier came from Lord Waverley's report. I put this quote up though, because interestingly, I think this might be the first reference of sea level rise that I've seen. So if you've never read the late Waverley report, it's quite tricky to get hold of, but well worth a read. And it says, for 100 years, there've been progressive increases, both in the highest levels reached in exceptional storms and in the frequencies with which such levels occur. So they studied the Admiralty records, looked back at all the long sea records we had, mentioned there seems to be some sort of onward trend, and then just dismissed it as a curiosity. And why wouldn't they? They didn't really know what was going on, but probably the first reference that something was coming. Uh, and Lord Waverley's report did then set the tone for what we did. Now, we didn't seal off the coast in one sense, but we did engineer vast amounts of it. And do not get me wrong, why wouldn't you? If I had this job in 1954, I'd be doing this. But it does leave as a legacy I want to talk about in the rest of this presentation. And you may recognize some of these places that the defenses are in. Interestingly, though, it's not the 53 reaction isn't sort of unique. If you ever go through London, do look out for the walls along the Thames because you'll see this sort of engineering strata. And each line has a history based on that cycle of a flood happened, we were overwhelmed, we added more. A flood happened, we were overwhelmed, we added more. And you can see the engineering strata. And of course, because London didn't get flooded, 
but was a near miss. We did have the uh, Thames barrier put in place on the back of 53. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if you look at the pictures of 1953, and I did talk about there was a lack of warning, um, rather interestingly, that photo is the Houses of Parliament in 1953, and they, for some reason, had sandbags all around them ahead of the Sturge. I don't know why. I'm not going to say any more, but that is a picture of the protection around the Houses of Parliament. So we have a shadow of 53 that's affected how we do flood risk in this country for a couple of generations and probably back since we've done flood defences. But how sustainable is that path that we chose since 53? And as I said, 10 years ago, we had a near miss. There have been plenty of near misses. There have been plenty of big floods, but this was a scary one. And I was our director of inter management on the day. I attended Cobras. I, I knew because of the history of 53 of the importance of this, trying to convince politicians that have never been through a coastal flood. The risk we faced was really tricky, but it was significant. It was a really significant event. And a lot of the public away from the coast don't remember it because, of course, Nigel Mandela died on the night of the storm and that dominated a lot of the stories. But communities were massively affected. 28,000 properties flooded in 1953, but there were still 2,400 homes flooded in 2013. A lot of the defences did their job. This is Hull and the Hull Barrier. And interestingly, that storm did get it was one of those sunny storms. There wasn't a lot of gales going around when the high tide and the surge came together. But that's actually the whole barrier holding back the highest tide it ever did from 17,000 homes in Hull. And there's the main road behind it. And I'm pretty sure no one driving on that road would know that was happening. So the engineering did a good job. It did cause some confusion. And I know we've got the word estuary in this conference, which is brilliant. But this top right hand picture, which I'll um, just zoom in a bit. This is Kibi on the Trent. You can see the earth bank and you can probably see boats floating above the houses. A Kibi is 45 miles from the coast, right? So trying to do a coastal warning for the town of Kibi is quite tricky, but this was overtopped and our pumping station was destroyed and many homes were flooded there. So big surges can go a long way inland, a long way from people who think, who think they're exposed from coastal flood risk. And I showed you Commander Nigel Parkinson's flood warning. The other thing we should value immensely in the generation since 1953 is how our forecasting has improved. <clears throat> in 2013, the storm hit on the Thursday and the Friday night of the week of the 5th of December. I got the first call from the Flood Forecasting Centre on the Saturday. And here's the fascinating thing of the world of technology now. The storm that came and caused the surge in 2013 didn't exist in the atmosphere yet, just in a supercomputer in Exeter. And this is their ensemble models where they run loads of different vari variations of what the atmosphere will be. And they all said a big storm was going to come at the top of the north at the same time as the high tides and was going to cause the problem. Which is fantastic because you ha now have more lead time. And, sad, uh, and, and you know, 307 lives lost in 1953, very, very few. Uh, and in 2013, because we had that lead time and we had that response capability. But I tell you what, there is an even bigger challenge to try and convince politicians to take response to something that doesn't exist yet. If you're going into a Cobra meeting and saying, there is a storm on the way, and they're like, I want to see the satellite picture. It doesn't exist yet. What are you talking about? It's quite a challenge. So trying to get that ability to use the techniques we have is really important. And some ways, flood risk is an interesting career because if you do it brilliantly, if you do it well, if you do it to the best of your capability, nothing happens. People are protected and they're not affected. And that's, you know, that drives us, that's the way to be. But it does mean that the erosion of understanding of risk does come, which I'm going to come back to. So although there were um, plenty of properties um, flooded, we had nearly up to a million properties defended by EA and local authority defences. Interesting on scale, I talked about the Netherlands journey, and they've done a huge amount of engineering, but their scale, we've got 2,800 kilometres of coast that were tested in 2013. The Dutch coast is the equivalent of the Essex coast. So they, their coast is about the same length as we manage in Essex. 
So we had a warning in 2013. We managed it brilliantly, collectively, all of these people in this room. But it is a warning of what's to come. And I just want to show you this, which uh, helps illustrate what cycle we're in. So this is broadly all of the countries in the world. It's actually the countries in the world in the middle of 100 kilometers square. So if you try searching your favorite holiday destination, it might not be in there. But you have from Afghanistan to Zambia, Basically, NASA put together this record from hydrological and meteorological records going back in 1880 and then more recently satellite records. And what I'm going to do is run through from 1880. The blobs will change for each country. If it was warmer than average, it will go red or bright red. If it's colder than average, it will go blue. And the challenge we have is that heat is already in the atmosphere and in the climate. And if you remember one thing from what I talk about today, it's this slide. So you'll all know the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change, and they do their sort of five-year stage reports. But recently they did one because they were so alarmed at the rate of uh, melting in um, Greenland and Antarctic. And they did a special report on the cryosphere, and it's got this line in, which if you work in coastal flood risk is sort of burned in your soul. Sea level continues to rise at an increasing rate. Extreme sea level events that are historically rare once in a century are projected to occur frequently at least once a year. And this is the killer line under all climate scenarios. So even if the world went net zero tomorrow, no one produced another gram of carbon tomorrow, this is the future that's coming. So 1953, 2013, they will become annual events by 2050. And what on earth does a once in a century event look like by then? And 2050 feels like a long way away, especially if you're looking forward to retiring somewhere on the code, whatever. But for many of the people in this room, it's the period of your career. So this is the, one of the other challenges. The two challenges I wanted to talk about is what's coming, how dramatic it may be, but also the legacy of 53, which I'll come back to, because I feel that the legacy of 53, it was the right thing to do. It was a brilliant response to what was a devastation, devastation caused along the coast, but it has created a bit of a myth of protection for that challenge I've just shown you. I like the dramatic rainfall noise I've got in the back of this presentation, just to give some emphasis. I have organized it. Um, again, you may have seen me use this picture, the Thames barrier. It's similar to the whole barrier. It's a fantastic photo. Here's the North Sea wanting to be that height all the way through London, the Millennium Dome. How many people in that picture know that that's happening? There's quite a few EA staff there quite focused, but how many others know that that's happening? And this, come, this slide comes from some work they've done in the Pacific, which I just want you to think about with this shadow of 53. In the Pacific, especially with a lot of the um, cyclones they've been having, they've been looking at the resilience to climate change impacts, especially coastal flood risks and storms. And what they found, broadly speaking, is in development economies like ours, there have been generations of investment in infrastructure, which has improved the infrastructure resilience of the country. Hence, we did so well in 2013 in many places to hold back a similar tide. But that investment in infrastructure resilience has eroded community resilience because people don't think they're at risk, because people are disconnected in some places from what they face. Clearly, it's acute if you're in a coastal erosion zone and it's affecting your how. But more broadly, on some of those photos I've shown where barriers are holding back tides, community resilience has been eroded. In developing economies facing climate shocks, because they haven't had so much infrastructure resilience, the community resilience has been shown to be higher. So they have better community preparedness for the shocks that are coming. And that's just something I want to show here because I want to then take you to a pub. I know it's a little early, but I'll take you to a pub. A pub you may know, um, the lobster smacking Canby Island. 
And here's one of the first pictures of the lobster smack in the 1800s. This is described in this uh, etching as the impregnable seawall. That's the Thames estuary. There's the pub. This isn't one of our flood wardens. This is someone stopping wool being smuggled in from Napoleon, I gather. So just watch this picture. So this is broadly the same pub. Look at the chimney and the two windows together there, because they do do a few changes. So that's the lobster smack in the 1800s. Now, unsurprisingly, the impregnable seawall wasn't as impregnable as we thought. You can see the two windows and the chimney. So there's been a flood. We do what we do as good flood engineers. We've raised the bank, we've widened the bank. Pub's slightly in the way, but we can deal with that as engineers. People can enjoy their Sunday walk. This is now the 1920s. You can see the wonderful car. And there's the Thames estuary. And this is the lobster smack now, which you probably know. <clears throat> now the thing with it, the reason I use these pictures is not because I'm condemning the lobster smack and we are doing some extra flood work as we speak on Canby Island, protecting and enhancing this wall. But there's a building that sat there for a few hundred years as we have responded to climate change by adding and heightening and adding and heightening. And all I ask is, what do the next picture look like? And it's a really, really difficult question, because I know what the answer is if I own the Canvey Island Lobster Smack pub. But as a nation, what do the next pictures look like? And that's what I'm saying is the shadow of 53. There's one more bit about climate change and risk that I want to talk about, and this is from at the work of Sunka, a brilliant PhD student at um, university. I put this QR code and I'll leave it there just for a second so that you can scan it if you want, because she's done some fantastic work. And she's about to start on the impacts of this work on UK flood barriers as well. She started in the Netherlands. And it's not just that things are getting higher, that the infrastructure we put in since 53 and the way we've approached it may not be sustainable going forward. So I showed you the, the uh, Netherlands approach where they've sealed the coast. And one of their biggest assets is in Rotterdam. Get, last chance to get the QR code and I will move on. <coughs> so this is the Matlan barrier. I was there at the Test Cozier, uh, a couple of months ago, last month even. And by the way, when they close a barrier in the Netherlands, it's like a moon launch in uh, Cape Kennedy. Buses come in with the locals and they sit on a hill and watch it. They have ice creams. They, I'm telling you, they have like a fair to see one of these things closing. This, by the way, is a time lapse, but this is this barrier closing and it's massive. It's three meters plus high that it can stop from a surge point of view. It floats across, those gates are hollow, and then it sinks down and links into place, but it takes you know, a good 45 minutes, an hour to close. Brilliant. It protects the Netherlands could do for another you know, tens of decades. But Sunker's work has shown there is a problem. And the problem also affects us. So this is looking back in the past since the barrier was created. The window in the middle is the summer months. And that gray slab is the time that you have to maintain that barrier because it's less stormy. The water levels are lower. The red bits show even in the summer times, they couldn't maintain the barrier because the storms came at the summer, right? But you've got clear windows to keep that barrier operating, protect Rotterdam. And at that point, that barrier is protecting, there is about 0.6 meters below sea level. That's the scale of risk that would happen if it got through. But what Sunker did is say, well, let's look at sea level rise. We know what's coming. Let's look at sea level rise and let's look at um, the future. And she's not even adding storminess in this, by the way. This is just pure thermal sea level rise. And on the lower end of projections, probably a meter. And you can see going forward, the window for maintaining this barrier that's protecting Rotterdam, it gets harder and harder until the point where it's frequently closing, so frequently closing, or <clears throat> you just can't get to it you can't maintain it. So even if your asset is effective, you can't maintain them anymore. And as an example, the Thames barrier, it closed 10 times to protect London in the whole of the 1980s. And in 2013, 14, it closed 50 times in one winter. So actually maintaining the approach we've got won't be sustainable as well as looking at stuff. But the good news, there is a bright future. And it was brilliant to hear your commentary about how we're going to do this. And I did look back at 2018, and there was a very thin 
not so great John Curtin on the stage in 2018. And interestingly, this is the question I posed five years ago. So 2018, the year we took climate change seriously. And actually, there's been a fundamental shift in people appreciating the risks we face, even despite all of the COVID challenges and the cost of living crisis and et cetera, et cetera. But the real issue is, have we understood the adaptation that needs to come alongside the green energy you know, mitigation, green economy is a bright future. No polluting cars, great green jobs. Adaptation is still a real challenge and can still be seen as a failure. And that's one of the things that this conference looks like it's going to grasp. Because since 2018, you, I, all of us have worked on a new strategy. And it's the first time a strategy has looked 100 years ahead and started to unravel the common journey we'll have. Because <clears throat> the key thing from 1953 for me is we should never forget it. And I wish we had a museum like the Netherlands did to reflect the pit lives were lost. But we should really be driven on our choices about what's going to happen tomorrow, not what happened in the past or our approaches in the last two generations. And this is where I think your conference can really embrace that thinking. And also, it's 15 years since the floods of 2007 and Sir Michael Pitt's review. And what he said then and what the councillors have talked about just now, and what I'm trying to say is, of course, key from Michael Pitt to now is communities are at heart of this. Too often, flood risk, coastal erosion can be seen as a technical pursuit, an environmental pursuit, an engineering pursuit. It's a human pursuit. It's a human issue. There are lives affected, and this will be a long journey from my perspective to correct the myth of protection we've created over generations to learning how to adapt again to the coast, which is what the Iceni would have done hundreds of years ago. They would have lived with the rolling, changing coastline that we see now imprinted as it is today, but wasn't like that a thousand years time and won't be like that in a thousand years hence. So we have to help work with, listen to, understand the challenges of communities to sort this problem. And that's the last phrase I use, because we've all learnt from a past and a past that's probably been set by that engineering approach from 1953, but it has loaded those two risks. It has eroded community resilience, and it probably doesn't yet, we don't yet understand the pace of what's coming. I mentioned that quote, 2050. That's not a long time, but someone who's been involved in crisis management for most of my career, there's not often you get 30 years notice of an impending crisis. Our choice is what we do with the time we're given. So thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks, John. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we have the traditional roving mics and an opportunity. We've still got some time for questions for John. Equally, for those people who are joining us virtually, do send your questions in as well. So anybody got questions for John and we'll get a microphone to you. Gentlemen at the front. Good morning, John. Henry Cater, I chair the Norfolk Strategic Flooding Alliance. So let's for a minute crown you king of flood management in this country and give you a budget. How would you spend it? Blimey. <clears throat> I would act, well, firstly, I would do more of the coastal adaptation that's starting to happen. So there are brilliant examples like Medbury, you probably know. We're about to do one at Arns Moors on, in Poole. So if you know Poole Harbour, there's an element of farmland that the farmer is working with us. We're breaking the seawall and it's creating a first line of defence from salt marsh that then, and it actually is still going to graze a bit of it, so we still think it's going to get quite a low income. So I would use some of my money to make sure that we can do as many of those adaptive processes, make sure farmers are rewarded where they have to give up land that they've had for generations. Interesting thing with Medbury, by the way, is the income from bird watching and tourism has probably replaced the amount of money. And apologies, I've had to have a suite, so bear with me. Um, the amount of money they've raised from tourism and bird watching has probably displaced the amount of money from farming anyway. So first and foremost, I would invest in natural flood management approaches. The other reason I say this is it's quite interesting. I know you've, some of you heard me talk this about this before, but if you think about the Dutch who are all in on uh, engineering approaches, they still are brilliant at natural flood management. They make space for their rivers. 
Um, there is a challenge for on the coastal side, but even if you've seen some of their coastal defences, they've recreated, rather than adding another layer to the Canby Island picture I showed you, they've created whole new sand dunes. And they've replanted them, and they've put communities with whole new coastal tourism and cycle paths. So they are also um, regenerating using natural food management and other elements. So I would invest hard in that. I think it's inevitable that we will need to replace barriers like the Thames Barrier and other major cities. One of the real challenges for the UK is it was built up on trade and coastal trade. And with the exception of a couple of cities that had groundwater for industry like Birmingham, you think of nearly every city in this country and it's either on an estuary or on the coast. So we have huge exposure to coastal flood risk. So we will have to be engineering. But even then we started the new design of the Thames Barrier 2. And one of the problems we've got, if it closes that frequently, how do you keep shipping going when the tides are higher? And when do you start introducing locks on the Thames? So you will have to, secondly, invest in uh, protection for going forward. But the third thing is, this is the controversial, this is the personal John Kirsten view, not the EA policy view, is I think there will be some communities that may not be able to stay where they are in 2050 as they are, as they were in 1950. And it's a terrible, you know, who, I'm not a politician. The politicians are elected by people to give the hard conversation back to them. I just, there is inevitable conversations that have to come because that slide I showed you, which I'm not trying to show you, to scare you the IPC one, that's massive. Once in a century, storms have come annual in the next 30 years. Who thinks we're ready for that? And if you keep communities where they are and promise them more and more protection, how much risk do you expose them to? So how do we invest in them, help create new communities, etc.? cetera? That, that is the big one. That is the big one. But that's probably the conversation we need to start having. And I feel for them. I, you know, for some of you know, my dad lives in Alborough lives on the coast, loves the coast, it's had its own 53 experience. If ever I go to the White Hart Club in Oldborough, they all know what I do and it becomes a town meeting and we have a long chat about the sustainability of the yacht club, <laughs> you know. And it's great, it's great for the town, but that spit, if the sea keeps going and the storminess keeps going, and personally, I think one meter is on the very low end. If Ivan was here later, he'd tell you some of the acceleration of melting is quite scary. So. Three answers would be much more natural flood management because I think it can be economically beneficial. I think it can improve the look and feel. It's tough and the farmers and landowners should be compensated. We do need to protect places for as long as possible that can be protected. But thirdly, we need to start this conversation with communities, I think, and it's tough. Right, we've got a gentleman just straight behind there and I saw another hand go up, another bidder at the back, gentleman in the black top. We'll come to you in a moment if we just do this gentleman nearest first. Um, hello, my, my name's Tim Bartlett. I work for, I'm a foreigner here, I do apologise. I work for Lewis and Eastbourne Council. I work on the South Coast. One of the projects I'm involved with is the Eastbourne Permanency Coastal Management Scheme. It's good you're welcome because I was just fearful you were about to say I own the lobster smack in Canby Island. <laughs> <laughs> It's going no, to be a I different don't. Conversation. Um, I hear what you say about that issue of rollback, but how do we look at rollback, particularly at the scale of the South Coast? If I had the answers, I don't know what. <laughs> I think it's. I mean, I, I, I'm worried about this. If I'm honest, I'm worried about this. It's quite interesting talking to. My, sorry, if I go on a parallel, but you know, I think about this a lot. I worry about this because. When I was a kid of the 80s, and I worried about nuclear war, you know, you have those sort of nightmares of, and then I realized talking to my daughter, she has equivalent nightmares about climate change. And the bit that worries me is politics nationally. And that's why it was so refreshing to hear your three stories, to be honest, because politics nationally, and I know this has been videoed, so this is a personal view again, is consumed by now and tomorrow. And I can get it, why wouldn't you be? I mean, COVID was, you know, once in a generation, cost of living crisis, people need to live through this next winter as well as in the future. I just think we need to start having this conversation. Because as I say, our approach has locked us into this myth of protection. And also this sort of psychological view that, I'll say it one more time, you, know, you close your eyes and think of the map of the UK coast and you can kind of see it. It was never like that, even a hundred years ago. Yet we've frozen it in mind and the first hardest stage is to start having that conversation about how there may need to be changed. That's what I think. 
until you have that conversation, because I don't live on the coast. I live in Warwick, which is about the farthest you can be from the sea. So as soon as I'm by the sea, we're in real trouble, by the way. But it's, the conversation is what I'm saying has to start. And it's a brave politician that has that conversation. And I can, it's easy for me to stand here with 30 years experience, but I'm not elected official. I don't, I don't have to support these communities for all of those bits and pieces. But I worry about what they'll be exposed to unless we have that conversation and go into denial about what's to come. I know that's not helpful in one sense of it, but yeah. Thanks, John. Gentleman at the back next to Sharon, if you do that one next. And there's a gentleman, if you could just show his hand in the audience. If I could just direct you over there, gentleman with glasses there and jacket. Morning, John. Um, I represent a company that's lost two thirds of its land to coastal erosion and most of its properties. Um, I just wondered how would you try to persuade me that adaptation isn't the same as giving up? I don't, I, I don't think adaptation is anything to do with it. Humans have been adapting for generations. Um, as, you know, if you lived on the Dogger Bank 10,000 years ago, you didn't sit there, I presume, wasn't there, sit there going, we'll just deny all this and won't become. People tried, migrated. We've always adapted. There's a great picture, which I used in the last presentation, I think from one of the Norfolk coasts, with a steam engine attaching itself to a house and dragging it away from the cliff, which they used to do every winter or a couple of winters. So I think adaptation is a natural human it's an evolutionary thing. I just think that we've removed it for a couple of generations in this, in this, in this particular space. What I'm saying is we need to create a positive story and future adaptation that matches the positive story we've had about climate um, uh, greenhouse mitigation. And, you know, new is can be better. There is a town, which I won't mention, but there is a town which I looked at, which was quite interesting, where it was deemed to be blighted by river flooding, right? This town has about 60,000 homes and has been in a cycle of three years of having flooding and those houses have been flooded quite a lot of times. And the EA has done its normal thing of banks being raised. But when you look at the amount of houses being flooded, it's probably only about 800. I say only, if you had one of those, it's awful. But a large number of those are loaned by the local authority. And if you had an adaptive strategy, that moved away from the river and created a green space and used that housing stock over the lifetime of its, the housing stock, not just run in, bulldoze it and go, but generate with climate change in time, you would have a city with a much bigger, greener space living with its river rather than engineering away the understanding of the river when we did in the industrial times. And you could beautify, improve that city and reduce the flood risk but you need to do it over generations of planners. And I think planners are one of the key skills in all of this, personally. So I think you need a long-term view. Where it looks like failure is if you come in and say, your house is flooded, we're giving up on you, goodbye. That's failure. Recognizing what the future looks like and how can we collectively help you get to something different in, in a few decades ahead, that's success. Thanks, John. Gentleman in the audience there with the microphone at the moment. I've got you, sir, and I've got one at the back, and I've got Rob as well. Sharon, do you want to just come forward and over to you, sir? Carry thank, on. thank you. Uh, my name's Mark Goider. I, I'm a trustee of the Old Nor Association, but uh, I was a Kent County Councillor in the 80s and, and have been thinking ever since about your point about politics and how do we make it more long term in its focus. The only thing that I've witnessed that seems to me to have a capability of helping is the idea of citizens juries and I wonder if well. you, you've thought at all about how one could develop that kind of really thoughtful deep participative yeah. thinking bringing in all the different stakeholders together to, to, to tackle these problems and say well look these are the options and when people go for the the, the, the cakeist option, um, the have your cake and eat it option, pointing out why that isn't possible and pushing them back towards reality. Do you have any experience of that? Do you have any we, thoughts about that? I know they have been used in a couple of scenarios, but not in this one. And I think there is something in that completely because you know, right at the beginning, I showed a picture of the young me starting my career and the older me. The other bit that's changed in my career is 
when I started in the National Rivers Authority as a hydrologist, I was quite untrained to say, go along to a community, bless them with your hydrologic knowledge and wait for them to be grateful. She's like, it's such a wrong approach. And actually what we try to move to, we're not always successful in the EA is, here's our knowledge, here's our expertise. How do we blend that with your knowledge and expertise to come out with a way forward? And that's a big shift rather than thinking there's something superior in my knowledge just because I went to university for three years and studied something. So people's understanding of place, understanding of community alongside the science, I think there is a way forward in that. And I, I, anything that we can try, because the bit that worries me the most, if you look at like 1953 and in the Netherlands is, and one of you said earlier that it's coming, but we just don't know when, we will change how we do flood risk in this country. I promise you that. But it'll either come from foresight, strategy, driving forward political bravery, or a catastrophe where hundreds lose their lives and a lessons learned review is written by another dame or lord and we implement those actions. In this room, we all know what those actions are from that lessons learned review that's not been written, right? So the key perhaps to this conference is let's start implementing them now without the catastrophe. That would be my challenge. Thanks, John. Gentlemen, just in behind, got a microphone already. If you just introduce yourself and ask. Oh. Good morning, uh, Andrew, Andrew St. Joseph, um, Essex Rural Coast. Uh, um, you mentioned that uh, undeveloped economies had uh, a better community resilience. Um, working in the, the rural coast way, you know, individuals can do stuff. There's a reason for that, uh, and it's nothing to do with um, development. It's to do with the number of rules and regulations that you have to obey uh, to get anything done at all. Uh, the National Trust on Northern Ireland uh, did a managed realignment on five hectares, and that required seven different permissions. Uh, for a private individual, it's worse because you don't have the funding back up to spend the time to get those permissions. What you're doing is perfectly sensible. Uh, it's small scale, but you still need a great scathe of permissions to do it. Uh, West Mersey's recharge for its harbour spent 70,000 on permission. And of course, once you get into protected species, you'll find that the, the pot you require to, to move water voles 240 metres is at least 4,000 pounds each. I mean, that's more than the residents of Pakefield get. So if you're going to have this view that uh, uh, developed communities are, are less resilient because the people uh, are not responding, the answer is they can't respond because there are too many things in the way. I think we agree. So I'm the, the a complex bureaucracy that comes with the developed economies and approach also reduces the resilience of a community to make the choices they need to make. I mean. It's difficult when you do a presentation like this on the journey of flood risk because you generalise and there are some communities that are wonderfully resilient. But I'm telling you now, most of those have had to go through something pretty horrific to get to that place. If you go to the Calder Valley in Yorkshire, they understand their risk, their brilliant resilience, the energy of the flood wardens, but they had to go through some pretty awful stuff. So I think we're on the same page. Some of the, the centralising of decision making away from communities to do some of this stuff make themselves resilient with our help to enable them is one of the roles forward, not telling you with lots of paperwork how to, how to do what you know better. Which is actually, to be fair, this is why I champion the flood committees. When flood risk became, and it's not always been this case for those who've been around, but when flood risk became a national grant, the biggest danger was a centralised grant going out to people on the ground. Having local voices and um, the voting system of those local committees is local authorities have, you know, the um, casting vote. You're starting to have local democracy blended with some sort of national funding. It's not there to make the sort of leap that you need. And we talked about with the citizen approach. But yeah, I think it's not just resilience around infrastructure. It's resilience for local people to make their own choices in this space. Thanks, John. Can we have a microphone for Rob? Rob's next, and sir, I'll come to you. <coughs> You're just after Rob, so if we can just do Rob first. Brilliant, I'll come to you, sir, and, and then final question from this gentleman. Rob Wise with the National Farmers Union in East Anglia. Um, a great presentation, John, and 
great to see the evolution of the presentation from five years ago in terms of your honesty and, as you say, your personal views, not the agency's views, because we have been coming on a, a journey of honesty about the needs for adaptation. And I think, you know, working across East Anglia, I've been interested to get involved in the long-term strategic thinking that's happening in the FENS through FENS 2100 plus and through the Broadland Futures Initiative. And these are two great initially environment agency led initiatives and F the FENS is the, f the only geographical area that's actually named in the national strategy because of its yep. strategic importance and because of the threat that it's under given that it's mostly below sea level. You talked about the 2013 surge. What we learned from that is practically the whole of the East Coast is at that kind of risk that mm. you're talking about coming every year in the not too distant future. So, you know, this conference, uh, Coastal Partnership East, the work that the agency is doing has accelerated our ability to get those conversations going at a large scale strategic scale for certain geographies. But we need to do it everywhere. Yeah. How do we accelerate the process to go beyond, you know, the, the, the flagship communities? Because, you know, every community that you put pictures up of along that east coast is facing those yeah. same threats and we're having the conversation but we're having it in pockets this next sentence will sound like a cop out and i don't mean it to be right one of the worst things about a conference like this is me standing here and pretending i can answer all these questions right you have the answers to these questions as much as me i'm posing my fears my experience and where we get to someone really positive, positive is when we blend your views from the NFU, your views from the councillors, your views from the, the um, RSPB, the engineers in this room, to take that way forward. So I'm not going to try and do a trite answer because I think it's bloody hard, if I'm allowed to swear on a say. I, I really think this is one of the biggest challenges. And I, I worry about that clock ticking. Because if you just imagine, you know, who was there in 2013? You went through it. It's just a it, decade has gone like that. And we have progressed, you know, and I show you Commander Parkinson to what happened in, in 2013, the engineering and houses protected to now. So let's not forget that we owe all of those people that responded in 53 a great lot of respect and admiration. I'm just saying we have to think differently now. And that's why I put that, you know, our thinking has to change faster than the climate. So I don't have all the answers and I want to listen as much as I talk in this conference, even though I have 45 minutes. But I'm telling you now, as I said right at the end, our choice is how we use that next 30 years. And it is probably the most critical 30 years for coasts that we've ever faced. Thank you, John Mike. Two more questions and then... Well, that would have been a great one to finish on, wouldn't it? Look at that. It would, well, it would have been, John. Oh, that was... Apologies, got them in the wrong order. I'll have to say all that again now. <laughs> These two gentlemen got yeah. great questions. Right. Gentlemen there. Yeah. Uh, hope, hopefully a great question. Um, uh, yeah, Steve Molyneux from um, East Suffolk Council. Um, just looking at the the, the sat well the sort of aerial image of uh, the Thames Barrier, you've got a huge body of water, and you can see that it's coming through. It's being filtered through, and I think there may well have been plans at a later stage. But in terms of generate or having generators to produce mm. power yeah. from that huge body of water that you're trying to keep back. Is anything like that happening over in the Netherlands? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just, for the sake of the engineers in um, the Thames Barrier, because I, I often get this, I, sh I shouldn't forget this, because people do worry about this, as recap of my presentation. Uh, this is done on purpose, by the way. If you don't know the Thames Barrier, those gates, when they're uh, closed, slide back flat so that navigate. I mean, this was all driven by navigation. 53 came, it took an act of parliament, ports were still open in London, so the main thing alongside flood risk at the Thames Barrier was to get trade through. It's now cruise ships that are the issue, but it's designed like that because what they do is they lift the gate a little bit before they're going to close it to flush out the silt and then slide them back in. 
So it's not leaking, which is the issue I had with Michael Gove. <laughs> he thought this was leaking. Um, but I do think the multiple benefits, so I said we started the first workshop, and I, th I can see a couple of faces here, on Thames Barrier 2, uh, which seems ridiculous because this thing will likely last for another 40 years. But if you roll back how long it took the first one to be built, where you build it, etc., and it was what are the multiple benefits? How do you get trade through it? How do you generate energy? How do you increase the environment? Um, one of the challenges is the impact you have on the estuary. So if, if you eventually come to a position where the Thames barrier would close so frequently, it would not be maintainable, as I started to show with the Netherlands, then how do you get trade through? Well, you probably need to have locks. If you have locks, you've completely changed the ecology of the Thames estuary because it's no longer brackish in London. It's now salt that side and fresh water that side. So all of those things are needed to be thought about, thought about, but that was not the objective here. But that's what that water's about. Thanks, John. Right, final question before we, it's this gentleman here in the light jacket. And then we'll save John's throat and you'll hear the <laughs> rustling as he goes off with a packet of I'm sweets. I'm gonna do some listening. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you, John. Um, Tim Beach, I'm on the RFCC, uh, one of their appointees, and I chair the Aldenor Community Partnership. And I, I live in a village, Snape, that flooded in 2013. And my question is, you probably answered it when you said you'd given a great answer, so it's a, probably a repeat. But the experience, I think, of all of us in this room is that trying to get people to engage with community resilience is really, really difficult. And you made the point we flooded, suddenly we've got an emergency plan, we're building community resilience. Is there somewhere or is it worth having a pilot where you make a real effort to build that community resilience within communities, and I'm talking down the coast, yeah. that haven't as yet flooded? Because right across Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex over the past 10 years, my experience on the RFCC is we have tried really, really hard. Many people in this room have done that and I've got to say it's really really hard work is yeah. there somewhere where that work has been done effectively and if not is it worth a try so the, there was some work done i don't know whether you know he's become famous because of covid but um professor spiegelhalter the social scientist statistician you might have heard him a lot he did work with the ea on a project called science wise which was really useful because it took three communities that are flooded and three communities that hadn't one coast one not and work with them about what would work Language gets in the way, human nature gets in the way. I mean, it, the, the stat I didn't realize, it usually takes someone to be burgled twice before, before they put security alarms in, All right? So it's, it's human nature. You know, I don't, if I lived, I don't want to know about this. I've got other things, I've got my kids' school, I've got to pay the bill, I've got the mortgage rate coming off my fix. I don't need to know about all of this. So I think to answer your question, it'll be a combination of everyone in this room and two other skills, planners and social scientists. Because one way out of it is to use the planning system to move people away over generations. So actually you roll with human nature because just showing this to someone, and I, I have to say, the best chance you get of having a community not flooded to start taking resilience uh, um, seriously is to talk to a community that has, not me. And they can tell their stories and go through their elements. And we had some brilliant work. If you Going back to the 2007 floods where Hull was devastated by surface water, tidal and river, one of the most effective things that came out of Hull was a play, which was all set in a caravan of people living a year of their life while their house was repaired. And that did a tour around flood zones and was probably the most impactful thing that the EA has ever supported. But that's other people telling their story, not us. I, I, you know, I will finish it. I can't, I can't stress so much how much I know this is a challenge. But I am really optimistic. I'm optimistic for a few reasons. One, as I said, new generation people coming in have been taught more about how to use their skills to solve this. We need to open it up and know it's a human story. So we need to know what are the other skills we need in this room alongside us. And I think we can do this, but it is hard. And the only thing I'll leave you is that what I said before, climate will mean that flood risk will change in this country. It'll either come from a devastating catastrophe or leadership from people in this room. So, and I know which one I'd prefer. Thanks, John. Ladies and gentlemen, just a big round of applause for John. Thanks so much, John.
who wisely took his sweets. He's worked with me before. Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, slightly, slightly behind time, but I just wanted to make sure we all have the chance to ask John a few questions. Um, can you please join me in welcoming a really good friend of this, of this conference and someone I've had the pleasure of working with for a number of years. Ladies and gentlemen, Giles Bloomfield from East Suffolk Water Management Board. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a, a brilliant opportunity to give an example of what a community in Suffolk has been doing for uh, a good many years now uh, to look at a resilience approach to deal with the immediate issues that is facing the community. Um, so we, we're, I'm going to give you an overview of the, uh, the whole estuary approach we have taken uh, in the Old Ore Estuary. Um, it's a partnership approach. Uh, this all came about uh, in the early noughties. The Environment Agency undertook a strategy on the estuary. And one of the options uh, through that uh, appraisal was a community-led approach. Um, and the community did indeed take that uh, mantle up and developed what was the old and all futures. There was extensive community engagement at the time. And one thing that was loud and clear, and this is against the challenge, is they wanted to keep the community essence that it was as long as possible um, and looking at approaches that would allow them to adapt as things change, as when things become more certain. Um, unfortunately, 2013 brought it real to the community because they actually got flooded. Um, significant number of properties, 26 houses, a couple of pubs. Um, and a wild damage to um, some of the rarest forms of freshwater habitats we have in the, the area. Um, so we came on board, this is the Water Management Alliance, um, we came on board to look at uh, options of how to address this. And one of the things we decided to do, first of all, was to undertake a hydraulic model to really understand the current baseline flood risk, and then what climate change impacts was going to potentially uh, bring to the area and then we tried to work out the economic value of doing something against doing um, uh, and, and nothing, and there was a whole raft of options. So uh, the partnership approach, so the old estuary um, plan was developed by the old estuary community group. That subsequently came to the partnership, the old estuary community partnership, which has a, a, a democratic um, base, so every parish council, town council and um, county councils and others have a, a place at the table so they is, is, is a, a purely uh, democratic approach local democratic approach the Suffolk Water Management Board is the local drainage authority behind the defences we manage uh, extensively the wetland mosaic of land so there's people and property but vast areas of very important wetland habitat it also has significant resources of fresh water that's used for uh, food production. Um, East Suffolk Council, obviously, are, are the local uh, planning authority, but also have a huge expertise in coastal matters and provide sage advice. But um, we also use their uh, technical expertise in the communications team, uh, Sharon Belize, uh, Sharon Ritson uh, principally, so we can engage with the community so there is a, a buy-in to uh, some of the issues that we're having to deal with. Um, colleagues from the Environment Agency, we have very complicated conversations. We've just discussed previously of all the good, bad and the ugly and the complications of funding. And we have, uh, which I think is uh, quite a, a, a unique situation, a dedicated trust. So we have a, a charity set up with the mandate to raise capital funds and also maintenance funds to look at the continuation of supporting the investment that we are proposing. So we started with a hydraulic model. Um, HR Wallingford were uh, commissioned by Karen Thomas, who was working with me at the time on this project. Um, and we basically un uh, went through the process of understanding the aspirations of the plan. Was it feasible for the community to hold on to the assets they've got um, as long as possible, as was very strongly brought back uh, by the community consultation? So we undertook the uh, baseline model. Um, the reality was um, in the 2013 event, we did have um, some significant breaches in uh, some of the flood cells. Um, Hazelwood Marshes was um, best part of 100 hectares of land that was flooded. 
It was uh, in, uh, internationally and nationally designated freshwater habitat, and that was basically wiped out um, by the, the event. The damage was so extensive, it was felt like that could um, be now best served as an intertidal habitat, and that is, is part of the mix. Um, so this sort of making space for water and adapting process was then sort of baked into the baseline model, and this was included for the assessment of the baseline. Also working with NGOs, RSPB, Suffolk Wildlife Trust, there were areas um, where the um, estuary where the walls were already low and there was an adaptive process already in place and those adaptions were further enhanced. So we, we created salt marsh habitats, we created saline lagoons. We in the wider sense, I talk about we, is a community effort and the expertise of those that are best placed to deliver the solution at least cost were, were you know, activated and galvanized into doing something. So the model basically said the plan was sound. You know, the, the remaining flood cells that we were looking at investing in with an adaptive solution, a resilient solution, um, were, were sound. However, the plan originally was to work on raising funding and every time you got enough money to do a flood cell, you would do one cell at a time and move through the estuary, focused on the highest people and property as being the, the, the premise for the decision making. That came up with a problem that actually once you increased the wall in one flood cell, that, that flood tide as it came in then transferred the incremental risk to the neighboring flood cell. So you ended up temporarily increasing the flood risk to your uh, neighbors, if you like, while the defense system was brought up. Um, there were strong linkages between the, the upper estuary um, works that we then, uh, so we looked at um, splitting the two groups down. And this was a um, combination of scale, uh, the environmental disturbance while doing those works to have a sort of disturbed area so then the bird breeding program could go elsewhere in the lower estuary and then we'd flip it and keep the quiet zones in the upper estuary while we worked in the lower. But it also come down the economics uh, and assessing what money was available from various different sources and how that might shake down to actually getting on and doing something. So that's a flood outline. Um, I'd be a bit flippant, all flood models are wrong, but it is a frightening example of the most extreme event of, of what actually happens within the estuary. And this particular model takes into account of the existing defences. So um, it could be uh, even worse than that if you sort of started from this theoretical do nothing scenario. Um, we had sort of challenges right from the start about doing nothing. And why not just let it go now? The areas where the, you know, it's not a, a, a important, it's just farmland, those sorts of narratives. So we actually um, were lucky because we had tidal lagoon power um, from the sort of seven estuary. We're looking for compensatory mudflats um, for while they were looking at investing in this tidal lagoon model. And we can create mudflats by knocking holes in seawalls because our marshes are all below sea level, substantially below. Um, so they undertook uh, paying for models for us to have a conversation with theoretically knocking holes in various flood cells, either individually or in combination. And the reality is it all increased the flood risk to um, the uh, people and property in the estuary because these holes were so large that the uh, flood cell, as it uh, uh, developed through the estuary, would fill these parcels of flood cells up with water before the surge arrived and therefore the surge was able to pro propagate further up the estuary than it would have done if the walls were intact. So of course this is then starts the, the conversation about actually if you've got to then hold the line as we would say as an engineer we're baking in this problem of you know are we delaying the inevitable some point in the future etc etc. Um, and, and, and normally you also if you knock a hole in the sea defence you then have to put a back line defence there's the grey line um, in, in the um, background there. When you um, do a cost benefit analysis, so I've, I've spent 23 years of my career, uh, the first 10 in the Environment Agency doing the emergency response, worked for the emergency workforce and operations delivery side of the business. I would be one of the people that arrived to do something uh, post event or before if, if it was at all possible. Later on, I, I started looking at the economic appraisal side of the um, you know, justifying investment uh, in a planned way rather than reactive. Um, points mean prizes. There is a partnership funding calculator in Treasury uh, Handbook, the multicolored manual. These are all documents we have to use to justify investment and it monetizes stuff in a, a standardized way so you can compare project A with project B at national level. 
and all this investment goes into a national uh, team at the Environment Agency for analysis. So going back to the grey line, it's all great if you do a managed realignment project and build that grey line defence and all the rest of it, but at the moment, if you look at the, the, the orange zones, that's where all the, the monetized value, as the Treasury book says is available to us, to invest in something. Put a retirement line on that. Whoever lives behind the new retired line is even less likely under the current rules to get funding in the future because everything you held dear was in front of you has now been given back to the sea. So a, a fundamental shift in funding models was needed if we are going to have an adaptive resilience approach to investment. And of course, if you move the defences close to the community, when we're talking about risk and exposure, you know, with a bigger tank of water just the other side, it all gets very, very frightening. So we discussed all of these, um, good, bad and the ugly and options, and even these conversations are live very much now with RSPB and the Suffolk Wildlife Trust with those land parcels that maybe we could in have some sort of tidal exchange, but it would be in the, you know, an engineered way rather than a full breach way. Um, we are still in this open dialogue, when to do it, how to do it, when are the funding models going to be available. We have things like carbon sequestration, scientists working on stuff, economic appraisal on these sort of things, polluter culture farming, peatland wetting, all happening live all over the country, but none of it's available now and we can't wait. So taking the model that's available at the moment, we monetize all of this stuff. We used a fantastic um, consultant, uh, risk policy analyst in Norwich, who were able to specialize on some of the more nuanced ele elements. And we had the thing called snake maltings complex, which an international uh, concert hall, which didn't meet any of the standard rules for funding. So we had to go on a bit of a journey there. But long and the short of it, there's all the stats, you know, 700, uh, 600 properties, 200 non-residential properties. Often those properties are either shops, pubs, uh, or f uh, farm homesteads. The government doesn't really worry if your pub gets flooded in a community, because on a national scale, you'll, you'll get something, a small amount for the uh, square footage. But if the pub floods, you can go to a pub somewhere else on high ground. So the economic losses for the country is reasonably modest. The economic consequence for a pub flooding in Suffolk is around half a million pounds per annum. Probably 50 to 75 staff, part-time albeit, are working in that pub. So the economic consequence of the flooding for a local community is massively more higher than these figures that we're talking about. But then the national figures, we're costing around about 12 million pounds to do something. We're avoiding damages by the flooding to people and property at 127 million cost-benefit ratios, superb, and we're in a sort of relatively rural area. The lower estuary doesn't have Albra, it has Orford, um, much longer exposure to, to um, fill in the defences, but even still, you know, substantial number of residential properties. Um, freshwater resources are huge in this area, and the freshwater resources are sucked out of the valley taken up onto the light land soil and it's some of the most productive warmest soils we have in the country it grows as our high quality carrots potatoes onions and such like you lose that fresh water you render that land useless for economic growth for a rural setting of course you may revert it to an environmental something else but it's not going to be a model that is equal by any stretch or compensatory as a standalone cost-benefit ratio, well still north of one, you know, £2.50 uh, return on your 25-year investment, which is the basis for, for the investment decision here. If you combine the whole S3 doing it at once, you've still got a cost-benefit ratio of £4.10 uh, £4. to your £1 spent. Undertaking this investment gives assurance to unlocking further economic investment. So these are uh, just a good examples of, of the legacy derelict uh, maltings complex at snake maltings which is crying out for for um, restoration and bringing in new jobs and um, economic growth to the area but you've also got the actual frontages themselves making these much more attractive green spaces um, you know 44 kilometers of improved sea, def sea defenses and um, accesses to those to, to all um, brings huge opportunity of driving economic uh, growth into the area leisure and tourism and um, the actual um, landscape setting, the area of outstanding natural beauty people come from all over the world to visit this. You've got all the way down to the bottom where RSPB 
on a national scale, the East Atlantic Flyway have put a bid, and the government has supported this bid to UNESCO for World Heritage listing. It's that important. So whilst I focus on people and property with our investment model, we also are guardians of some of the rarest habitats and species on this planet. And there are species that are so small and are so uniquely attached to this environment, we have to have a program of their assured survival and thriving into the future. And at the moment, the government policy and funding doesn't really support this model, and we need to do something about it. Our preferred management solution, the community wanted something which was adaptive, um, and it was resilient um, to, to the pressures that we were seeing. So we used the International Panel on Climate Change predictions on sea level rise, the UK SIP 18 figures, baked them into the model, and we come up with a, a plan that we were going to raise the defences to a level that there was equity and flooding across the whole level, and these defences are going to be designed raised a little but not an awful lot it's more about the back face uh, treatment that they are quite steep on the back face and we're relaxing them right back out so that if the north sea does come in it can safely overtop these defenses roll down the backside without causing undue damage to the integrity of the defense and the majority of the water will be tanked in behind the uh, defense network without flooding people and property and that after the event passes is then pumped back out through the internal drainage board infrastructure. This design um, is an adaption on works that we're learning from our colleagues in Norfolk. The um, Environment Agency had a 20-year uh, project of um, looking at the tidal defences and, and did a resistance uh, and adaption design there, and we've followed that technology through, and a lot of the staff on that project have rolled on to this project giving expert advice on that. We have to make the design so that it's um, you know, integral to design concepts compliant with government funding rules. Um, and with the economic modelling, it, it was very clear that there was an ability to split the phasing of the, the, the work for the environmental, the economics, and actually um, the disturbance of people and property living in the community. So we undertook an appraisal for a business case for the upper estuary as phase one and we're developing phase two business case as we speak. With the flooding event in 2013, um, David Cameron as Prime Minister went to Somerset Levels and uh, mentioned uh, to them that they could have a disaster recovery fund. Um, we also put our hand up for that and said, thank you, we'll have some of that too. Um, what this allowed us to do as a community uh, was actually do something and try and actually get some time and motion calculations. So we did phase one of Aubra and you can see the extensive uh, nature of the works in question of what it requires to um, enhance a wall to make it adaptive. It's in progress, the wind rowing, the material at the moment, but this wall actually toes ended up to, to the back of the hall road, so the slope is substantially um, improved. Engaging with the community, we started really young. We had a primary school that was at high risk of flooding, so um, my colleague Pete Rod Roberts, I believe, is in the audience, had the brilliant idea of getting them out onto site. One of the reasons was we saw little footprints on the marshes around the Harris fencing. We were looking at the plant probably at night time and seeing what they might or might not like to do with it if we weren't watching. So we thought, well, we'd dispel that myth and have them all into site. Um, so we then had a, an idea of, well, let's bring the engineering into it, the geography of the school curriculum, the environment, site safety, and giving them a sense of place. So they were all there, they got a hat, they got on a digger, they got a mug and a sticky bug, um, and a good day was had by all. Then we come on to the tricky bit, funding. Um, there are, everybody's invested in this project for, for points of view of making it happen. Um, the 12 million pounds business case, the good news is we've just got that through funding from the Environment Agency. Um, it's taken us the best part of the 10 years to do that on the journey. Um, the farmers have taken out a mortgage for £3 million. Um, they were able to do that through the Internal Drainage Board um, with a public works loan. Um, the government FCM GIA, so there's a flood and coastal erosion risk management grant in aid, is the substantial part of the, um, the cheese. Other departmental government funding is, is uh, another uh, fund that looks at things like school infrastructure and other public assets, and they've got an indicative allocation. 
Um, public donations are quite sizable. Um, we're, we're already north of a million pounds, I believe, uh, at this current moment in time. The Garfield Western Foundation were gave, uh, early patrons of half a million pounds to help us get underway. Um, the Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, RFCC, um, they actually made this project happen. We had a £2 million funding gap on the 12, and they actually saw the importance of getting us underway and closed that gap. So thank you very much. The red bit. The red bit is still the remaining bit, and it's my, uh, my nemesis, if you like, at this moment in time. It's about £20 million. It's about £20 million. I, I, I hesitate that because we have all this in global instability and it's very difficult to plan for what the thing's going to cost. Um, of that £20 million, we have risk contingencies and inflation baked in, and that's £13.7 million. We might not need all of that, but the perverse outcome of government funding is unless you get the whole, you can't have any of the government funding. So even that conversation's live with the Environment Agency at the moment, saying, come on, guys, we've got a dedicated charity here that have got a key you know, job of getting this funding. And we've got this programme at the moment of a four year, uh, eight year programme, which is roughly working four years in both areas. So we've got time, we've got the funding for this bit, and we've got four years now to try and find 20 million pounds to close the funding gap. So where are we? Um, my colleague Pete Roberts is leading on the delivery. Um, David Kemp and Mark Johnson at the Environment Agency are dealing with that bureaucratic paperwork process behind the scenes to try and help us make it happen. Um, and we've got all sorts of plant excavators, environmental mitigation, ecologists, all working so, so in, in that process to make it happen. Um, but we are on a journey and it's uncertain, but um, we're up for a challenge. Community engagement. We have full participation in the community through the partnership. Um, the community group um, has regular meetings and we have various instruments of cascading through the Older Association, the Older Estuary Trust, the East Suffolk Water Management Board, etc. And, and we have these um, updates and they can be about something specific or it could be something general. Through this engagement, and it was alluded to earlier um, about what's happening on the open coast and Slawden is um, the uh, Shingle Ridge, which is between the North Sea and the estuary. So you can just see the estuary in the background and opposite that is the Sudbourne embankment. So there is a genuine concern that things are changing and it's changing at a greater rate. It's complex and what uh, traditionally used to happen um, in my early career at the Environment Agency, I used to maintain a haul road and they used to drive all the way from Auburn, which is behind me, down to uh, the Ness, load up shingle in dumpers, haul it all the way back and tip it over the edge to keep the Aubra and uh, sword and frontage um, in check. Um, the Environment Agency um, increasingly felt that that was unsustainable and I tend to agree to them. But what you have is this a leg legacy defence or perceived to be a fence is actually a haul road. Um, and it looks quite stark and it, it looks a bit frightening when it's no longer there and it looks like it's disappearing. But what's actually happening working with nature is it's knocking it flat and it's expanding and you can sort of see the pillowing out and fanning out the shingle behind and over time we're expecting that to roll back and fill in. We're lucky that this has already happened very locally uh, between Dunnage and Walberswick. This is my early, uh, well about 2008 middle EA career was a major breach that occurred in here after a storm event and you can see a legacy drainage ditch that run in behind the back there and of course that was able to connect that to the sea and a, a delta opened up there um, during that event and maintained that. We got nervous, um, I, I, I um, called chicken and put a bulldozer in and closed the gap on that occasion. High pressure was building and it wasn't closing up. Subsequently though there have been much bigger breaches than that and uh, we have wait and see, and the North Sea has closed those breaches on just single tides when the conditions are right, many hundreds of thousands of tons of material. But what is happening is the whole profile is lowering, it's coming broader. So in a storm surge event or even higher spring tides, the water comes over the top, fills up behind, and the hydraulic pressure on the two level up. So basically drowning out that defense network. So it doesn't disappear, it's just there underneath. The flood extent behind is exactly the same. You don't, you know, 
change the damage that occurs in the wetted up area, but the dynamic of the way that water arrives is slower, calmer, and generally safer. And if we've done our job right, we've told people to go away and come back after the event. So nobody dies, hopefully, and that's always the ultimate sanction. I mentioned the older estuary trust. So this is a beautiful picture. It's on their website, their front cover website. You can see the ex extent of the works we've done in the phase one. These are the new borrowed ditches to make the clay running around the outside. That is now huge tanks of fresh water. So when we're looking at adaptive climate change, it's not just about coastal. We must consider our fresh water resources in the east. We're drier than Jerusalem and Morocco, and the water is important for every aspect of living, be it trees, plants, bugs, beasties, our, our drinking water, etc. You can see the extensive works done post our investment with the landowner and RSPB and others um, to make, further enhance that wetland habitat. So this is bringing in the um, ecotourism, which was alluded to earlier. People come and watch this and spend many hours. Mental health well-being is incredibly important, and our connection with society has only enhanced since we've had the COVID outbreak and people have been able to only walk in their local area as part of the national commitment to keep safe. My last slide is a plug for uh, the Old Restory Trust for points of view. There's the website. I wish I had a QR code too. That would be clever. Perhaps I'll do that for the next one. But um, we need some money. So if this has been of interest for you, um, little or much, um, that would be very kind. So thank you very much. And I hope that's been of interest. Really, really interesting, as I'm sure you'll agree. We've got time for a couple of questions, because I can hear coffee. And anybody who knows me, that will get me off the stage really quickly. Um, so any questions for Giles? I did see any hands go. If there aren't any, then I'm going to ask you to thank Giles. You know what he looks like? He'll have one of these buckets, probably, around the dinner time, looking for the contributions. Checks are gratefully accepted. Uh, cash is even better. So yeah, what we'll do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we'll break for coffee and some refreshments. Please go and look at the exhibitions, do some networking. We talked about the pledge for the coast as well. If you can be back at 11.45, we've got the legendary Karen Thomas, the legendary Karen Thomas, on at 11.45, and you don't want to miss that. So ladies and gentlemen, have a good break. <laughs>